Hello, my name is Julian and in this video we're going to be looking at design research and how we can use techniques to unlock insights for your users. So whether you're building a brand or product or wanting to develop an existing service, we're going to take you through a number of different techniques that you can incorporate into your projects. So what is design research? Well, it's all about qualitative data, which means we collect small amounts of rich data as opposed to collecting lots of surface level data. We still use existing data sets such as analytics to augment our findings, but we aren't data analysts. So why do we use design research? Well, design research is used to get closer to our users so we can understand their goals and the challenges they face. And we use this at the initial stage of work to also start a relationship with them so we can co-create responses for them in the future. We have found that through design research, we're able to build brands, services and products that respond and answer genuine problems, which are people focused and not driven to appease shareholders or tick boxes. Without the users, these projects can't happen. So there are a number of benefits to this approach when it comes to design. The first one is that we're creating designs that are truly relevant for that user. The second is that through this research, we're able to understand the actual problem these users are facing as opposed to perceived problems. The third is that we're creating designs that are easy and pleasurable to use for the user. The fourth is return of investment. Investing in research upfront saves time and resources by avoiding costly redesigns and reworks, resulting in better user adoption, customer satisfaction, and long-term business success. The fifth is competitive advantage. We would argue that it provides a business with a competitive advantage as users would prefer their experience. The sixth is risk mitigation. Because the designs are created from user research and then tested with users, the risk is reduced. So onto the methods. So firstly, there are a load of different ways of doing design research. And a skill you'll have to develop is deciding on which technique and which method you're going to use depending on what scenario you're in. We've chosen five really effective methods that we use at different stages in a project. The first one is ideal right at the beginning of the project. The second is ideal when you're trying to co-create a future with the user. The third can be used throughout the project. The fourth is a great way to explore how users live, eat, work and play. And then the final method is used to get a sense of what is important for that user. So method one. So this one is a bit of a curveball as it's a workshop that's been neglected recently, but it's perfect for projects that involve a lot of different stakeholders and is ideal to be run at the very beginning of the project. It is known as an open space technology workshop. I know it's a bit of a mouthful, but it's a lot simpler than it seems. Open space works best when the problem is complex, involves diverse groups of people and ideas. The workshop begins with introductions which cover ground rules around workshop do's and don'ts. The most important thing to open space is that people are always present. If you're not contributing to a discussion, then find another group that you might be able to add value to. If you would like us to make a video more specifically about workshop etiquette, let us know in the comments and if we get it enough, we'll definitely make that for you. And while you're there, maybe drop us a like. And if you're really enjoying the video, do consider subscribing. It really helps us out. So back to the workshop. So the first thing is to establish the general question or theme that the workshop will cover. And we're gonna allow individuals to propose discussion points around that subject. We're gonna share all of these discussion points with the wider group and then break into groups to discuss individual subject matter further. Every individual can choose the group they want to join. And within each of those groups, we ensure that there's a lead to make sure that everyone has opportunity to contribute and also a scribe to make sure that everything is documented. As mentioned before, if an individual doesn't find that they're actually contributing to that group, then they can get up and go to another group. This is known as the bumblebee technique, and you can often be taking different knowledge from one group to the other, which also helps the overall development of the day. If there is time, each group will share an overview of the discussion that they've had. And at the very end of the day, everyone will get a document that sums up everyone's individual group 
conversations. So open space technology has a number of pros and also some cons. The main pros are it starts a project off well and it provides ownership for these users. It also doesn't assume the problem is known and it allows everyone to have a voice. The cons, however, is that it needs a, a number of facilitators to really allow it to work due to the amount of people that can be involved. It also needs a big space potentially. It's quite heavy on admin and it can often take a long time, maybe even one to two days sometimes to actually get through the, the entirety of the subject matter. Method two, collage. Often the hardest thing about the design research process is that initial barrier to start conversation. A way we've managed to break this barrier is through a creative process. In this case, collage. We provide a load of different images, generally from a selection of magazines and printouts. And it's important that supplied magazines and images have a variety and selection of images, both in terms of style and colors. So images that cover people across a, a load of different backgrounds, ages and abilities. Also ensuring that you have full body, portrait, people being active, people being passive, people being happy, people being sad. Have images that cover different landscapes and environments such as countryside, cities, parks, etc. Images that talk about transport, so that's cars, buses, bikes. Images that are colourful, images that are black and white, have patterns in them, include food. As well as these images, you'll also need some coloured markers, some paper and some glue. So once you have all of that material, the workshop is pretty simple and it really revolves around the question you're trying to answer. So for example, we could be asking the participants to explore their thoughts on their local town, or we could be asking them to explore through the use of collage, a recent experience they've had of a brand. We then get these participants to create a collage that sums up that question or that inquiry. As they build the collage, we ask further questions about images that they're, they're making and how they're chopping them up and how they're placing them together. At the end of the workshop, we ask each participant to explain their thinking about the collage so we get a deeper, richer understanding of their thought process. The pros for this is that it's really simple to set up, allows people a non-verbal way of sharing their thoughts. The cons currently with magazines can be quite expensive, particularly if we're having a lot of people involved in the workshop, as we really do need quite a lot of magazines. Method three is interviews. Interviews are really the mainstay of design research. There's really no substitute. They are the best way to understand the hopes, desires, and aspirations of who we're designing for. While interviews can be quite daunting, they really are the most effective way of getting to know your users as they provide you insight and also start building relationships that you can develop in the project as it develops. So the first thing to consider when it comes to interviews is the location of the interview. If it's at all possible, try and interview the person in one of their spaces. So that could be at home or in work. We want to learn as much as we can about them and it's a great opportunity to see the space that they actually inhabit. Try and take some photos of that area if you can. In the same vein, we're also hoping to make them feel comfortable. To that end, try not overcrowd the amount of people that will be involved in the interview process. So three people maximum, the interviewee, the photographer, and a potential note taker. When it comes to the questions you want to ask, we're looking to go from wide to focused. So initially we're exploring their life, their values, and their habits. Then we're trying to be more specific. Questions that relate directly to the challenge and make sure we're asking questions that are open-ended and not leading with our opinions. One of the most important aspects of the interview technique is the actual note-taking. Make sure that's perfect. Ideally, get it recorded. Be aware that the words they say are only 7% of the story. 50% of the story is also body language, with 38% being vocality. So if you're not quite sure what their body is saying to what their, their words are saying, try and delve deeper to see if you can kind of get a further insight into that. So interviews have a lot of pros. They're the easiest way to truly understand who you're designing for. They do build a relationship with that person as well. Cons, they can be logistically complicated when it comes to many users or many stakeholders. You can do group interviews, but one-to-one -one is still the most powerful way of getting to know people. So method four are safaris. There are a few ways to do this, from you observing the user to getting them to make a, a journal of their routine. But what it's really about is trying to get a deep sense of how these people live through the creation of a diary or journal. 
The diary is created either through the designer spending a day or week shadowing them to understand issues and challenges that they face, or the designer can provide them with documentation tools such as a camera or notepad. We are looking to understand about their lives and how they make decisions and watching them socialize, work and relax. Now this is a fantastic way to get a sense of their overall daily life. It's easy to replicate when we're looking at the remote version of that. However, because it is remote, that version can also sometimes fail to work if we haven't built a substantial relationship up with these people already, because quite often we're actually asking them to add to their daily routine, which can often lead to incomplete diaries. Method five, card sorting. Card sorting is used in a number of ways depending on the methodology you're working with. In the context of digital projects, card sorting can often be used to help with structures of websites through categorization. Cards can be created already or they can be created within the session itself. The goal would be to understand what content might sit together or what language is used to sum up a block of content. Card sorting is also used in a human-centered approach to help understand what people think is important and how important it is compared to other things. It also helps develop deeper conversations about the participants' values and why they do what they do. So how does this work? The difference with the second version of card sorting is that cards aren't just text. They can also be images, as this can often help with getting rich insights about the participants' thoughts around a theme or subject. This approach can also be built through additional questioning. So for example, if we were working with people around the idea of shopping, and we had asked them to order these images on their current experience, and then asked them to reorder the cards as if they didn't have a car, we can see how potentially different elements of the shop become more important, such as frequency or even types of food. So the pros to card sorting is it's easy to compare from person to person, as we could potentially be using the same cards. The cons are that it's always limited by those cards. We can allow people to create their own on the fly, but that also potentially does lead to inconsistency. So thanks for watching and catch you in the next video. And don't forget to let us know what you think in the comments. Have you used these techniques? Are there other techniques that you'd recommend?